Welcome to the Tesla Power Podcast, the unofficial Tesla energy community covering solar panels, solar roof, and power wall for your home. I'm Aaron Brady. Today, let's talk about free power walls in Rhode Island. Let's talk about the Ford F-150 Lightning with Tesla Solar, maybe? Let's talk about Tesla doubling the number of power walls in 2020. And Tesla updates the power wall software. Lastly, but not leastly, our solar roof is power on. Let's do it. So let's start with audience participation. It's the portion of the pod that's for questions. It's for comments. It's for community input. And you can input in two ways. Number one, you can call 203-816-5150. You can leave a message or you can record a message, video, audio. Email it to teslapowerpodcast at gmail.com. So let's chat. We've got Julia Nugent who writes this week, quote, following up on your discussion of demand response, I'm building a new house in Rhode Island with a solar roof and intend to be net zero. Because it's ultra low energy, not my main house, and I can do net metering, I was originally thinking about not doing a power wall. So recent news that you could only buy a solar roof with power wall and the cost increase was kind of a bummer, right? The local utility though, National Grid has a program called Connect. Uh, connected solutions that pays you to pull power from the battery during peak demand events. It's not a lot of money, maybe a thousand dollars a year per power wall, but it's something you can do a contract with the utility every year or Tesla does a contract and they get the incentives for the first five years and they discount your battery proportionally. And here's where it gets weird. This incentive combined with the federal tax incentive added up to slightly more than the cost of the power wall. So each time I added a power wall to my theoretical system in the Tesla calculator, the cost went down a little. Now you can try it out using my specs. It's an address in uh, East Providence, Rhode Island, $200 utility, end quote. I mean, I went to find an address in East Providence. So it looks like that uh, region is also known as Riverside. So if I go over to Google Maps, I found this spot over here, 12 uh, Fergalade Avenue in Riverside. So I'm going to copy that address and let's put it into the design studio. 200 bucks, right? There we go. $200. Let's see what we got. Uh, you can see that editing the power wall quantity doesn't change the price much. So let's edit to three. I mean, the overall price, or like the price out of pocket does change, but you can see when I go back to the calculator, it's like 31, uh, 253, 31,253. And that's with three power walls. If we go up to four power walls, <laughs> 31,063. I mean, that's pretty sweet. So of course, you know, I would go max batteries. <laughs> Those of you that follow Ryan McCaffrey of the Ride Lightning Show, you know that range is king and the solar equivalent is storage is king. So we had a crap weekend this last weekend and we ran through our battery during a two day um, you know, series of doldrums because we were hosting for Memorial Holiday. The heating elements in the home, you know, like the oven, the stovetop, um, you know, in this case anyway, they're the hungry hippos that are pulling a few kilowatts when they're all on at once. This is great low that the price essentially stays the, the same no matter the number of power walls that we uh, select in this instance. I mean, if we were to go all the way down to one, I mean, we're still in the $31,000 range. I mean, clearly more power walls, more better, right? So interestingly, I was trying earlier, I couldn't select just one. It does allow me to select just one here, but uh, presumably that would be because of the requirement that the full panel be backed up by the power wall. Um, so I don't know if the value of the solar system is less than $200 a month, or maybe that's right at the line where you can add one power wall or more. Um, but it looks like they presume that you have sufficient load to exceed the nine kilowatt pass through on the new power wall two plus, but let's play around with the uh, quote here. I'll start with a much lower average bill, right? Uh, if I go back to the main one, solar roof. I want to order. Let's put in that same address. For whatever reason, you have to select the 
address that they autofill for you there at the bottom. So, oh, maybe I didn't put in 200 last time. Maybe I put in a lot less. But anyway, 50. If we go next, we can see that we can edit. Well, it starts off with one power wall. Let's go with a higher value, though. So if we were to go back and order, same address. Going to click their thing. Let's do $400 a month. It's closer to what we pay here. So you can see they start us at two power walls. They do let you go down to one. I don't know. I was playing with this a little bit earlier and it wouldn't let me go down to one. But, I mean, I still get that more power walls, more better. But let's go back to the $200 a month average. What was the max power walls we could do? I mean, we could stay on 400. But let's go back to the 200. Two hundred, and how many power walls will they let us? I mean, because fewer is less expensive. Can we get it under thirty thousand? Oh no! So it starts to go back up after what five? Yeah, so thirty-one six. So between four and five, it starts to go back up again. That's pretty sweet, though. Four power walls for less than if you were to just get one power wall. That's kind of insane. But government incentives are insane that way. Yeah. It's less if you do four power walls than, than just one. Anyway, that's kind of bananas. Super interesting. And it can definitely be a great deal. There's got to be a sweet spot in there. I think we found it. But... Um, Anyway, that's, you know, our caller comment for the week. If you have something that you want to ask or something that you want to contribute, maybe you want to correct something that I'm saying, call in to 203-816-5150, email teslapowerpodcast at gmail.com. Leave your name, where you're from, say your thing. Let's target about a minute or so all in. And let's take another quick break and I'll be back with some of this week's news. If you have missed the Ford F-150 Lightning, I would be shocked. See what I did there? The uh, Ford F-150 Lightning has been huge, huge news. And you'll see that uh, MKBHD had a great video showing that it's a good-looking truck. If, you know, maybe a little unremarkable looking. You know, it's definitely not the weird mobile that the Cybertruck is. <laughs> I don't like that thing still. It hasn't grown on me that much. But the big news about the Ford F-150 Lightning is that it functions as a whole home backup. Like days of backup for your home. You know, if you have something, I don't know, the battery is something like 100 kilowatt hours. And I think on the higher trims, it's approaching 200 kilowatt hours. Nobody's exactly... Um, they don't know exactly what the battery sizes are. But if you were to get an equivalent number of power walls, you'd need to purchase 10 at a total of around $75,000. Now, this truck is expected to start at something like forty grand, right? So why wouldn't you just buy the truck and use that to power your house, right? I mean, of course, it's not that simple. But since the F-150 Lightning will only output 9 kilowatt peak... And if you're stacking power walls, you get nine kilowatt per power wall at peak performance. But, you know, it's worth thinking about how much throughput you would need. It's unlikely that you'd need, you know, nine kilowatts or nine, you know, 90 kilowatts. Yeah, of peak power for your house. I couldn't even imagine. Like you'd have to be running a, um, like a laser or something or grow, grow house, <laughs> you know, to need that kind of power uh, output at all times. But still, you know, the battery value alone on this truck is pretty incredible. It makes you wonder if Powerwall prices are going to drop significantly once these types of vehicles start to hit the streets. You know, there's no sane person that's going to leave their truck at home for backup. And if your house lost power, you'd really want to be dependent on your transportation to be powering your home. Probably not. So how are you going to get more supplies? I don't know. But 
you know, the value here though is undeniable. And the burning question, is Tesla gonna allow you to connect your Ford F-150 Lightning to your Tesla solar and power wall system? Not a chance. <laughs> Why not, you ask? I mean, coordinating a third party is not what Tesla does. You see, they've slowly swallowed up third party devices for integrated, um, um, and, like for integrated products that Tesla designs, right? They've got the Tesla inverter, the Tesla gateway, the Tesla battery, the Tesla solar panels, and on and on. And this, this wouldn't prevent you from using your F-150 Lightning for backup, but it's not gonna be seamless. You'll have to pull like some kind of breaker lever or something, which is actually what they show in their ad. So if we go over to the F-150 Lightning ad, let's just play this thing. And you'll see they're modeling the city going out, you know, all the power going out. And they, they know automatic backup right yeah right there automatically powers your house but it requires user uh, intervention to initiate power output from the truck to the house anyway it's possible that that's just for dramatic effect but you know still there's no denying that it's likely to be um poorly integrated with any third party when it when it first delivers and it's nearly guaranteed not to be integrated with tesla energy products I'd love to be proven wrong, but you know, we, I, I, I don't see it, you know, for sure. I know a couple of people who put in their reservations. I'm pumped to get a test drive when they take their delivery, but I, I don't know. It's going to be an awesome truck. It, you know, it's home backup capability is truly astounding. And Joe Ordia, I mean, he's got tons of really great videos on this kind of stuff. He's got, um, a set of videos on the Ford F-150 Lightning and its implications for home backup specifically and beyond. He goes way into detail. I highly recommend you check it out in the link description. All right, next up, Electric reports that Tesla has doubled the number of power walls installed to 200,000 over the last year. Now this is before requiring the power wall to be part of every solar installation. That means it's delivered more in the last 12 months than it did for the first five years of that product. It's hardly a surprise, you know, the power wall stacks up very favorably against other battery options. And again, Joe Ordia at Solar Surge, he's got a whole fantastic series on how the Tesla power wall stacks up to the competition. It's not always the best in every way, but its value for money is super compelling. It led to Tesla being back ordered more than a year on power wall two when it was introduced. And, you know, supply, seems to be catching up. I was able to add two power walls at the last minute on my project. I was really afraid, honestly, that it was gonna be months before I could add them, but they've been ramping like mad over the last couple of years, even with the Model 3 and the Model Y continuing to take a huge portion of supply for automotive. I'd heard that, um, you know, that tes what Tesla was doing uh, to ramp automotive cell capacity, especially the new 46AZ form factor, but I hadn't heard a peep on ramping the 2170 cells for stationary storage. Now we covered Megapack a couple of weeks ago and how that's ramping deliveries, which should put even more press pressure on the residential storage supply. But with so many plates in the air, you know, specifically with Tesla, how are they gonna keep their eye on the residential storage capacity ball to make sure they're able to well serve that market? It's a, a huge concern of mine. I, I guess the good news may be that they don't need to use their own supply to fill this demand, right? It's one thing that isn't often discussed, but Tesla sources 2170 cells from multiple manufacturers for stationary storage. And perhaps that's the only way to make this happen. I don't know. It's notable that automotive manufacturers are rolling out pouch cells rather than cylindrical cells for their cars. I wonder if that's because they can't get the supply of the cylindrical form factors due to demand from Tesla, Tesla energy products, Tesla cars, and that sort. That might be something, I don't know, that we need to look into in a f future episode. Let me know if that's of any interest to you in the comments below. All right, next up, we see that Tesla updates Powerwall with better energy plan. Uh, and this is another electric report and it's their software for Tesla energy products for your home. The updates include users get notified when Powerwall reaches low charge level during outages. Solar only sites get better monitoring tools, which is cool. Tesla Energy 
uh, sorry, Tesla Energy Plan and Tesla Virtual Power Plant display more information about those programs in the app. Now, Tesla Energy was something that you might not be familiar with. It, I wasn't sure about it. I needed to look it up, so I did, and I could see um, in the um, in the Tesla Solar Configurator they don't let you just rent or just lease the panels. You can get some financing, which you can see down here, but it looks like this Tesla energy plan is mainly for international markets where Tesla sold, uh, solar is sold as a purchase plan. You might call it a lease or power purchase agreement. This is where they put the panels and the power wall in your home and they sell you the energy that it generates. So you don't own the system. The two most prominent programs are in Australia and the United Kingdom, as far as I can find. And it appears that Tesla ended this type of program in the United States, so you can no longer rent panels from Tesla. Um, they'll still give you a loan, as I was pointing out. Um, checking my app, I can see that uh, I have the latest version. Let me just pull this up. Let me see if I can share it with you guys. I should be able to do this. So you can see like what's showing in my Tesla app specifically. Yeah. So let's just make this full screen. So let's pull up the Tesla app, which I have here. You can see down here, I've got the um, two power walls showing version 20.40.3. So if I tap on that, it does show that I've got version 21.13.2. Yeah, so. Oh, my software version is 3.10.12. My Powerwall has the previous software, 20.40.3. The release notes show that, um, let's get into those release notes, right? The release notes here, they show that uh, this is only available in selected regions and devices. So I guess, you know, the di big difference for me, of course, is that uh, United Illuminating doesn't have an agreement with Tesla to operate as a virtual power plant. So that leaves me out of the wholesale energy market, as I've mentioned before, but we do still enjoy net metering. So I would smile, honestly, if I could get a bit of the incentives that Julie, uh, Julia and Marty have getting free power walls and huge demand response rates. Anyway, that's it for our, our uh, news this week. Our system is on. I wanna share some details with you right after this. So we are clear, the check is cleared, we are power on. We've been up for about four days now. The Tesla app, you can see here, let's go back to it. Um, the Tesla app here, uh, we've switched the system on, we're starting to produce. You can see here the power flow. Right now, um, you know, we're just drawing from the power wall. But if I go to the graph view, uh, we get a lot more detail. I am of course completely obsessed with the app. I'm watching the stats for production, consumption, battery state, total energy, going back to the grid. It's interesting to see how much energy we're offsetting uh, per day. They show that energy offset, uh, let's see, under performance. So if I click on performance, you can see our solar offset for today is 153%, which is awesome. You know, We generated a lot more solar than we used. Um, and it's something that I hadn't really thought about, you know, though it directly affects the net metering, you know, that we enjoy, of course. You can see here that we've had several days of poor production. That's in the graph area. So today was pretty good. But, you know, over the weekend, you know, we only were making like 12 kilowatts, uh, 12 kilowatt hours per day for a few days in a row. And, you know, that meant that our offset had been less than 100%. And... And when we have high production days, you can get, uh, you can see that we get way above 100%. 
And it's just beautiful how the different portions of our energy system can be overlaid or isolated to give us a great view of our energy usage and generation over time. Um, I also have access, interestingly, to my brother-in-law's solar system. So let's hop over to that. You can see here. Uh, they have a solar edge inverter. And you can see over the past few days that their energy generation hadn't been awesome. Um, specifically today, you can see that they've generated 59.24 kilowatt hours. And if I go back over to our app on today, you can see that we have outproduced them uh, by one kilowatt hour. <laughs> But it's very cool. So we can compare how our sol solar systems are producing. And it really seems like in low production days, the solar roof has outperformed the standard panels. Very cool. In the higher production days, though, we don't seem to do as well. So it's early days. Not really sure this means anything yet, but we'll keep an eye on it. One huge difference between our installations, you know, the one that our brother-in-law has, is that we have a battery. Uh, they don't. And... It does mean that we're able to use more of our energy because we can store it for use overnight. We have the pool pump going, and as long as I turn it off overnight, we have plenty of juice to get us through till morning. And we haven't yet turned on the AC, so that'll likely be a nail biter and impossible on low production days. Again, we'll see how that goes. But most of my interaction um, this week, talking about Tesla um, uh, personnel, it, it's been virtual and virtually ignored. So the creative director wife and I were anxious to get our invoice paid so we could be power on, obviously, right? Especially with some beautiful days. But our account had been set back to pre-installation once our pricing had been corrected. Um, so that means that, you know, we um, have to chase down a couple of people to get the detail we need to get the money to Tesla. So after several email, emails were ignored by our once helpful project advisor, we tested, texted one of the project foremen that had done the roof tear off. He didn't reply to my text, but we did get an invoice that night and we got uh, the check out the door ASAP. Two really interesting things from my perspective anyway. Number one, we had to pay by check. We did have the option to pay by credit card via PayPal, but I don't understand why they would require an old school check. It just doesn't seem like Tesla's MO, you know, it should be more high tech. Like how do I pay a Bitcoin? Yeah. And then number two, we didn't get the official power on notice. So because our account's been kicked back to the beginning of the project timeline, there's no one to tell us to switch this thing on. So one of the Dave's that had uh, done the electricity stuff had pointed out that uh, the breakers just needed to be, you know, flipped. So the second the check cleared, we flipped them switches and so much for communication, right? Generally, I'm a fan of not talking to humans, but you got to admit, it's unsettling when you need something to be sorted out or maybe the system gets reset or maybe the pricing tally gets wonky or, you know, I don't know. I've, I've certainly had a more positive experience than negative ex experience, but there's no doubt that there's some room for them to improve. And this means, you know, just overall though, now that I've got the pricing, this does mean that I can get into the nitty gritty and see what the real value proposition is on our system. Um, see how long the payback period is, uh, see what the alternative costs would have been and the ultimate recommendation or warning for other potential solar roof and Tesla residential energy customers might be. So, Deep dive on the financials coming up next week to help inform your decisions, enhance your experience. I don't know. Satisfy some vicarious curiosity. Hopefully, you know, we'll justify this, uh, you know, super sweet solar glass action for yourself, right? Because that's what we're all looking for. We're all looking for the reason that we can buy this thing. So huge thank you to Ryan McCaffrey of Ride the Lightning for inspiring this pod. Thank you to the other YouTubers helping to educate me and the rest of us on the components and the implications of these products. So go click on the links to them, their podcasts. I mentioned the show notes, highly recommend them. And that's episode seven of the Tesla Power Podcast, the unofficial Tesla Energy community. I'm Aaron Brady. Let's do this again next week. Uh -huh.